Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at the Long Now Foundation, and uh, you are at the second of our shelter in place uh, seminars about long term thinking from our normal series. Um, tonight, uh, we uh, have a special guest from SETI, Lawrence Doyle, and uh, He's going to be speaking about a kind of a technology that is one of our oldest technologies. And we, I think we often take language and communication tools for granted, but they are technologies of a sort that have allowed us to connect with uh, our past and our present and even the future um, with certain types of written and other uh, communication tools. And it has seemed obvious for a very long time, I think, to, um, to all of us and uh, obviously to researchers more recently that animals have been communicating with each other. Um, but it's only with some of the newest tools that we're, being, that we're able now to understand the extent of that communication. And these are the same tools that uh, people like Lawrence Doyle are now applying to signals that we have been listening to for a very long time from the cosmos and uh, to understand is this signal or is this noise? And, and if we don't understand the language, just like we don't understand much of the language from the animal community, uh, how are we going to determine a signal from a noise? And so this is why uh, SETI has turned to animal communication specialists and researchers like Lawrence Doyle to start to understand this. And he's going to share a bit from the cutting edge of the space with us today. Welcome, Lawrence Doyle. Thanks very much. Um, I want to acknowledge my colleagues uh, Brenda McCowan and Jim Crutchfield at UC Davis, and also Fred Sharp of the Alaska Well Foundation, and Michelle Fournay at Cornell. Um, we're a collaborative group, and um, I'm the SETI expert. My background's astrophysics, but also information theory, and it's information theory that we'll talk about today as the mathematical tool with which to try and derive an intelligence filter for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So the basic idea of this talk is that if you can, for example, use Antarctica as a proxy for Mars to study conditions for possible life on Mars, then you can also use humpback whales, for example, as a proxy for receiving an extraterrestrial intelligence signal. So that'll be the theme of the talk is mixing SETI with animal communication, and in particular, bottlenose dolphins and humpback whales. So at the SETI Institute, we, uh, we have our president, retired, Dr. Frank Drake, and uh, many years ago, 60 years ago, he basically came up with an equation for organizing one's thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence. And these are the factors that go into that. Do you have a good star? Do, that, does those, do those stars have planets? And given planets, is there an ecosystem? In other words, liquid water is what we use for a proxy right now. And given a place to live, does life develop? Does biology happen? And of the biological species, do some become intelligent enough to have a complex communication system? And the reason that's highlighted is that's going to be the focus of our talk today, although anybody at SETI Institute is allowed to go up and down the Drake equation. Finally, F sub C is do intelligent species develop interstellar communicating technology? And then lastly, L, which is we're most ignorant about, and that is how long do such civilizations last? Like we can study Egypt, but that only lasted, their civilization lasted only 3,000 years. <clears throat> so that's the Drake equation. And in that context is the reason that an astrophysicist is up in Alaska recording humpback whales. Now we can look at factors like good stars and a good star may explode, but that in itself, as we can see, this is the uh, spiral galaxy M96. 41 million years ago, a supernova went off there and supernova create the chemicals, every chemical but hydrogen and helium, which was made in the Big Bang, were made in supernova or merging neutron stars. So here we see a supernova at the 12 o'clock position on the picture on the right. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And that is basically a dandelion of the galaxy. It's created the elements with which trees and people and humpback whales and, and planets are made of. And it also basically transmits them throughout the galaxy. <coughs> well, another skip is to the term F sub P, and that uh, great progress has been made recently on that in the last 15 years with the launch of the Kepler mission. Kepler discovered over 4,000 planets, including some of Earth's size. And you can see the planets in the upper right there in the Kepler field of view. So I'll just say I was on the Kepler uh, science team. My job was to find the first planets, if planets could exist around double stars. Since half the stars in the galaxy are double, it would be a significant find if we found that not only do double stars have planets, but that they could exist in the habitable zone. So <clears throat> I was fortunate to spot this guy, and it's a, a small red star and a solar-like star, and it's circled by Kepler-16b. And because in Star Wars, uh, Luke Skywalker was on a planet called Tatooine that had a double star sunset, I thought it would be fun to nickname it uh, Tatooine. And one of the guys from the NASA um, team, a manager, called George Lucas and asked if we could nickname this system Tatooine. So could he come to the NASA press conference? So we had a press conference, and George Lucas couldn't make it, but his, uh, the director of Industrial Light and Magic, John Knoll, showed up. So we got to have him as part of the, uh, the press conference, and it turned a, a scientific discovery into kind of a world-class uh, news story. Tatooine discovered, science fiction becomes science, and so on. So that was a lot of fun. I wouldn't want to live that way, but it was a lot of fun for about a week. Here's a movie of the system, a simulation. That's Kepler-16b there, which, by the way, is in the habitable zone of these two stars, which changes as the stars orbit each other. So it moves you know, in from the inner to the outer part of the habitable zone. These two stars are called eclipsing binaries because they go in front of each other. And the planet was discovered because it transited in front of both stars. So that was a neat discovery. And so we now know that circumbinary planets exist. And uh, almost half of them are in the habitable zone. So there may be some mechanism putting planets in the habitable zone of uh, circumbinary planets in the habitable zone around their two stars. There may be a mechanism because that's about four times more frequent than we find uh, planets in general in the habitable zone. Okay, so that's just a general background of where I'm coming from before I start doing intelligent signals from the oceans of Earth. And you could call that extraterrestrial, if you want to substitute aquatic for terrestrial. So we can practice remote detection of other species by looking at the millions of communication systems, both biological and botanical, on Earth. And we can derive general rules, mathematical algorithms derived from information theory, to develop uh, a mechanism to look at intelligence, whether there's intelligence in the uh, signal. And the signal itself, I mean, the way SETI has been performed so far is to ask the question, is there a transmitter out there? And you can make narrow transmissions, uh, one hertz wide. In other words, you can tune onto a radio channel and turn the dial and you're on a new channel. Well, nature can't do that. The narrowest, uh, I think it's an OH maser in a gas cloud, emits radio, but you'd have to turn the dial 300 times to be on a new channel. So to get on a new channel is technology, is proof of technology. So SETI's been looking for narrow carrier waves, but they have not examined the message because how could you tell from the message if it was intelligent or not? Well, I think I can convince you by the end of this talk that we've come up with some beginning methodologies 
to quantify whether a message itself is intelligent. So in some sense, SETI itself, search for extraterrestrial technology is what's been going on, but the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is just beginning. Finally, the rules can help SETI by broadening the detection parameters. In other words, by looking at all different kinds of communication systems on Earth, we hope to derive mathematical representations that generalize what intelligence is, because so far, frankly, we've been looking for human-like intelligence. And there are discussions at SETI meetings as to whether they're transmit pi or the golden ratio or some mathematical thing. But the minute you're face to face with a humpback whale, you realize that they're intelligent, incredibly intelligent, but not human. So we have to deprovincialize our thinking about what an intelligent signal is, I think, before we can maybe recognize an alien signal, if and when. Now, to make sure we're not confusing an alien intelligence with something like astrophysics, we started our, our analysis with pulsars. Pulsars are regularly pulsing supernova remnants, but at the time of their discovery, they weren't known to be uh, well, they were called LGMs, which stand for Little Green Men. And the basic idea was that they're so organized, I wonder if it's a, me a measure of technology. So here's what a pulsar sounds like. You can think to yourself, is this intelligent signal, Morse code, what? So if you heard that, would you say that's a technological beacon of an intelligent message? Well, we will examine, I'll show you in a minute, uh, some of the intelligence filter uh, mechanisms that we apply, and we applied it to pulsars. And you'll find that we'll have no difficulty distinguishing astrophysics from a true extraterrestrial intelligence signal. Meanwhile, these are some of the species that we've looked at. Bees dance, that's their form of communication. Um, cotton plants uh, basically talk to, uh, well, I'll look at that in a minute, but they basically send chemical signals. Orcas, humpback whales, bottlenose dolphins all use audio. And um, chimpanzees use facials and gestures as well as audio. And elephants use rumbles in addition to trumpeting and so on. So, in other words, all animals communicate and all plants do as well. And uh, it'd be a shame to not practice on them, right? We'll look at bees just for a minute. Uh, bees, of course, start out as um, nurses. And all the bees you see flying around are, are females. And then they graduate to construction workers and then they finally graduate to navigators. They go out and find honey and report back in the hive. And the way they report back is they use what this image shows, the waggle dance. And the waggle dance, uh, they have muscles in their necks that indicate where vertical is in the dark hive. And they waggle at an angle from the vertical to where the honey source is. And the vertical means where the sun is. And the angle of that waggle looks like it's tilted right now about 30, 40 degrees. That's the angle from the sun to the honey source. The number of curves or waggles is the distance. So they use polar coordinates, in other words. And the time it takes to go across that waggle before they make the loop, that's going to be uh, how much the wind's blowing. So they have to, uh, they get an idea of um, how much honey to tank up on so they can make it there and back. The, uh, the young bees that are new to the waggle dance have to watch it several times, but the older uh, established bees, they watch one waggle and they go right to the honey source. So it looks like it's a learned behavior. What's most interesting is that it is definitely symbolic. The honey and the flower is not there in the hive. So they are discussing something that isn't present. And there was some argument in the literature whether bees have symbolic language, but I think it's now settled. The uh, bottom left shows a swarm. And there it's called the DVAV dance. It's a different um, 
dialect, you might say, of the bees. And there the, the scouts are discussing um, which, has, uh, which scout has found the best hive. So it's a kind of democracy. There's a nice book a Cornell professor wrote, I believe, called it's called Honey Bee Democracy. So we have a democracy that's millions of years older than ours. So in general, I think people that study animals and plants for that matter uh, have found that every uh, that the critter they're studying is more intelligent than they thought when they started. I don't know any instance where the researchers said, gosh, they're dumber than I thought. It never goes that way. This is an, uh, a, from a paper I wrote about a communication system analyzed with information theory between a cotton plant and a wasp. So the idea here was that if we can apply in not just an inner species or inner phylum, but an inner kingdom from the plant to the animal kingdom, uh, information transmission, then um, we could apply it to an extraterrestrial signal someday, if and when we receive one. So basically, this cotton plant is sending a one-way air traffic control message to this wasp. And uh, the wasp w did pretty well, but a 73% success rate on landing on the right uh, cotton plants, the cotton plants had predators, some were worms, we'll say, and the other was a caterpillar. And so they put a gas chromatograph in the cotton field and they uh, took all the predators away, herbivores, and all the dead leaves. So there's only a chemical indication as to what plants the wasp, which likes the caterpillar, should land on and that it should not land on the worm-infested uh, cotton plants. And sure enough, about 73% of the time, the wasp would land on the, the caterpillar-infested cotton plants. So that means I would say that this uh, air traffic control system is evolutionarily young because it hasn't reached peak efficiency. Also, the cotton plant was putting out 2.4 bits of information, which means there are five choices. So that was the plant's vocabulary. And I speculated in the paper that, therefore, the cotton plant, why would it have a vocabulary of five if it only had two predators? So I said there were more predators, predicted there were more predators. And that's what the botanists uh, that called me from University of Pennsylvania, they had found that they said, how did you know there were no more predators? And I said, well, the cotton plant told me. And that's when I think botany people got interested in information theory, which could give you an insight that you wouldn't ordinarily have, even between uh, the plant and animal kingdom. But we're going to emphasize in this talk and in our research, we've emphasized uh, marine mammals because they put most of their communication in audio, which we can record, they also are social, their social networks are very complex. They have culturally passed on traits. And um, we know they're highly intelligent. So, so we'll emphasize bottlenose dolphins and humpback whales. This is a bottlenose dolphin dictionary. It's a made up of uh, contour, K means cluster analysis, 60 points for those mathematicians at this talk. And we used it to classify the whistles by contour, which we also did an experiment. There was experiments done that showed that bottlenose dolphins consider contour to classify the different signal types. So in other words, the contour is important to them, kind of like us saying howdy or howdy or howdy. The frequency shift and the duration doesn't doesn't define what the word is. The word's defined by the contour howdy. So similar with bottlenose dolphins. So now we're going to skip to the first intelligence filter we would use, and it's called Ziff's Law. And basically, Ziff had some graduate students that he had classify, uh, actually number, Count the number of E's, the letter E in Ulysses. Count the number of 
R's, count the number of O's, and so on, down to the number of Q's. And then plot them. And space, by the way, in English, occurred about 15% of the time. About 10% of the letters were E. About 8.5% were T and so on. About 0.1% were Q. So, that was, um, that was interesting because he did a plot. And the plot itself produced uh, a slope of 45 degrees or minus 1. Now, what did he plot? He plotted the frequency of occurrence with E's at the top and Q's at the bottom, and he just put them in order. And he had a line fit, and it made this minus 145 degree slope. I know it doesn't look like 45 degrees, but it is. So what does that mean? That means that there's a distribution of the letters in a book in English that has this minus one slope, which means that the most frequently occurring compared to the next most frequently occurring and so on will produce a logarithmic minus one slope. So he think, well, that's amusing, but then he did Chinese letters, minus one, same thing. Then he did Russian phonemes, minus one. Hmm, that's interesting. If you record a Japanese conversation, it'll come out to obey Ziff's law if you plot the phonemes in order of the most frequent to the least frequent. Well, that's interesting. So basically, most, almost all human languages uh, obeyed Ziff's law. And there's a lot of other uh, codes that you can use Ziff's law to decode. Like, for example, Morse code does not obey Ziff's law if you just plot a dot and a dash. But if you plot a dot and a dot and a dash and a dash and a dot and a dash and a dash and a dot plus dot and dash so that you have six components, it goes up. The slope goes up. And by the time you are including dot, dot, dot and dash, dash, dash as individual unique signaling units, it's obeying Ziff's law. So in other words, you can use Ziff's law to decode. So let me just point out that we did a pulsar. We looked at those pulsar pulses I showed earlier, and we did a ZIF plot, and Y equals minus 0 0.6963, that's the slope. So in other words, a pulsar has a ZIF slope of minus 0.7. So isn't that interesting? It, it doesn't obey ZIF's law, which is great. We wouldn't have expected a pulsar to obey ZIF's law and therefore be a possible linguistic signal. Now, some of you out there that are familiar with Ziff's Law, you may think that there are other things beside languages that obey Ziff's Law, and that's true. But Ziff's Law is a necessary, although not sufficient, condition to be a language. So in other words, if you fiddle with the units of signaling and you don't get Ziff's Law, then you don't have a language. You can go to something else. So it's a first-line test. If you do get Ziff's Law, you may have a language, but you're going to have to apply a further analysis, a deeper intelligence filter that is called Shannon Entropies. Let me just go back here. Okay. Now this is a humpback whale sound. Is this a language? Okay, did you just hear an intelligent communication system? Well, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Unless you use some objective mathematical feature. If we look at the frequency of occurrence of all human languages, we get a minus one slope. And it wasn't thought that any other communication system on Earth would have this minus one slope. As a matter of fact, Linguists regularly uh, talked about Ziff's law being a distinguishing factor in human languages compared to all other animals. Well, you know, after 100 years of saying that human physiology was entirely different from all other animals, which is a Victorian notion, we finally outgrew that. 
We even found that genetically, uh, the simplest plant is more complex than human genetics. But right now, we're still in this, uh, should call it a transitional period, where we're learning that human language may not be that isolated compared to, uh, you know, all the other critters on Earth. So I think Ziff's Law and what I'm going to tell you about uh, information theory will help. So information theory basically measures the dependence of uh, signals on each other. So it's called entropic order. And the first level of entropic order, zero order entropy, is just what is your vocabulary? And what we do is we take the logarithm base two of the number of signals. And what that means is just how many bits can your language carry from just its, uh, for example, its letters. So the second order entropy, well, the first order entropy is Ziff's law, basically. The second order entropy says, what is the diagram structure of a language? So in other words, it says, given a letter, I'm thinking of a letter. Guess what the letter is? You might guess E. But what if I say it's the second letter in a word, the first letter is a T? Well, now you're probably going to guess E or H. Well, you wouldn't have guessed H before, but knowing that a T precedes this letter, you see that there's a conditional probability. In other words, the T affects what follows it. And so you guess H. And that would be correct because the is the most common um, written uh, word in English. So information theory basically is a measure of the complexity between signals and their conditional probabilities. And one way of thinking of it is somebody asks you, what is information theory? Well, it measures the relationship between signals. So uh, you might say the rule structure. So given a certain rule structure, why would, I mean, humans use rule structure, but why would animals develop it? And it turns out, uh, bullet two here, it allows error recovery. In other words, uh, if you uh, get back to your desk and you've made a copy of something and it's a bad copy, then you can fill in missing words and missing letters because there are rules. So you're using the context, which in other words, in mathematics is the conditional probability between the signaling units, in this case letters, to recover missing letters. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. So is there some reason to do this in the wild? Well, yes. If signaling is important, then this allows error recovery. So anything that allows error recovery of a critical signal has survival value. And this is an example of low toner, which we all have seen. And um, you can actually get missing letters and words and recover them. Okay, pulsars do not obey Ziff's law. Good. Well, there were baby dolphins that were... Let me first preface this by saying uh, human babbling does not obey Ziff's law. Human babies babble with a more equal frequency, so it's a much flatter slope than minus one. But as they grow up, the, uh, the yellow uh, dots in this show that they, they're random, and then the yellow developmental stage is when, uh, an, when uh, babies get very redundant. They say the same thing over and over, mama, 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 or whatever, and they're encouraged to drop the click sounds because they're, if they're not being raised in Zulu culture, and they're encouraged to make the M sound because they're being raised in English culture and so on. So... Basically, this shows the yellow plots with error bars show that babies babble. They do not obey Ziff's law. Then they don't obey Ziff's law in adolescence because they're getting very redundant. So instead of being uh, very diverse, 
uh, making all sorts of sounds, they turn to redundant, making the sounds of early English. And then they wind up where you see on the far right with Ziff's Law. Well, the, the blue are, is a, the recordings of two baby bottlenose dolphins that were born at Marine World. And if you look at the, the yellow, underneath it is the blue line. So the two superimposed. In other words, we recorded baby bottlenose dolphins and they were babbling their whistle language. They were making random noises that landed exactly on the ZIF distribution that we gotten for babies babbling. So in others, we could show mathematically that the baby dolphins were babbling their whistles. And they don't get into the mama, mama, mama thing too much. They don't go down as deep as the yellow line, but they wind up with minus one slope, just like human. So we caught the babies. We can show mathematically that baby dolphins babble their whistle language until they learn it. And then they, when they learn it, it obeys Ziff's law. So bottlenose dolphins, adult bottlenose dolphins, obey Ziff's law. And this was the first time a non-human was shown to obey Ziff's law. And since then, there have been several other species that obey Ziff's law. Humans, bottlenose dolphins, not squirrel monkeys, and not ground squirrels. So, and this is a syntax diagram, which shows that dolphins also have second order entropy. In other words, they have conditional probabilities between their signals. So they have a kind of syntax or grammar. I don't know what term to use besides saying quote syntax and grammar because uh, animal linguistics is a young field. It will no doubt have its own nomenclature sometime soon. But for now, I'll just call it conditional probabilities between signals, which makes sense because it's important they communicate to each other and have error recovery that exceeds the ambient noise in their environment. And this is one way to do it. This is the mathematics of it. Just want to show you there's honest to goodness mathematics behind information theory. And um, I'll just keep it at that, except the P, the log two means that the units are in bits. The unit, the bit unit was introduced by Claude Shannon for information theory. And so when you, if you know, have heard what a bit is, then you're talking the language of information theory. And the P means the probability of occurrence of a signal. So basically first order uh, information entropy is you add up all the signals, probability of each signal, and the log base two of the signal. And what that means is that will, how often will the signal occur times how much information is in that signal. You add all those up and you get a number for the Shannon information entropy. And the word entropy is similar to that used in thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, you have a gas and you open up a, a container and the gas can be in more states with a larger container. So the entropy increases. And we know that from our, you know, if we leave our rooms alone and come back into our room and things are scattered all over the place, then, uh, you know, that's just simply entropy, thermodynamic entropy. Well, information entropy is how many possibilities you have. So the information entropy of Chinese characters, which are thousands, exceeds that of English, which we have basically 27 units if you include space. But it doesn't mean we can't say the same thing in English that we say in Chinese. It means, though, that English has to start into the higher order entropic relationships uh, before Chinese does. Okay, humpback whales may have the most complex acoustics in the ocean. Uh, they certainly have more signaling than human language, the average human language. And they also had a, what might be called a global internet millions of years before humans did. They basically, the ones we studied are in Southeast Alaska, and that's where they make social calls and feeding calls. When they go to Hawaii, that's romantic. They're supposed to mate and they sing songs. So there's uh, definitely uh, a difference between Alaskan vocalizations 
and Hawaiian vocalizations, as there would be between an average conversation in human and an average human song. There's all sorts of indications about how intelligent they are. And uh, anyway, here's what some of them sound like again. Now, there was a piece of song in there. You did hear a wee like that, and that was a piece of song. But mostly it doesn't sound like the songs you usually think of humpback whales as making because uh, these, are, these are chatting. These are social calls and discussions of things like bubble nets and how to fish. So we know humpback whales also make nets of bubbles to catch herring in. And usually if they want to not, if they don't make bubble nets, they just shovel like krill, which are a kind of shrimp, into their mouths with their long flippers. But they've developed a skill in Southeast Alaska, and I'm not sure where else in the world, uh, where they build nets of bubbles. And they basically shovel the, they chase the, uh, the herring into these nets and um, then they come up with their mouths open and eat them. I'll show you a net in a minute, but I want to show you a, uh, I want you to listen to what might be considered an argument in humpback whale. Sometimes the bubble nets fail, and there's this kind of chatter argument, which if I wanted to anthropocentize, anthropocentric eyes, uh, this observation, it would be, that they're arguing, I was there, where were you? See what you think. So it doesn't sound very romantic, does it? So here's an example of bubble nets. Uh, on the right is an illustration. And from the air, the diameter of those spiraling bubble nets are about 100 feet. And they catch herring in them. And we've tried reproducing a bubble net in miniature. And it's very difficult. The idea, we just don't have the technological intuition that they have whether it's Boyle's Law, which has to do with gas bubbles and expanding, or Bernoulli Principle, uh, buoyancy, and you just have to have a lot of technical knowledge to catch fish in a net of bubbles. Listen to this. So we heard that one day, and it was the tempo and frequency range of human. And I thought of trying to make uh, talk to each other underwater when we were kids, and that's what it sounded like. It was a basically an attempt by the humpback whales, I think, to communicate in human. Uh, that's, uh, of course, an overinterpretation, maybe, but it sure sounded like they were attempting to make human-like sounds. What you just heard was a humpback sound. Uh, so what we want is their language, not ours. So the first thing was to say everybody quit talking so much in the boat. But um, I think that was an attempt of a non-human to communicate in human to us. Not that far from SETI when you think about it. Okay, and here is an example of uh, a bubble net coming up with us nearby taking pictures. And um, this is a feeding call again by a humpback that we nicknamed Miles after Miles Davis the trumpeter. See what you think. If 
I were a herring, I would run from that. But it turns out that the humpbacks make this sound that is in resonance with the body of the herring. So they don't have much choice at all. They're going to be scared into the net by, by the humpbacks. And they've been doing this for millions of years, we think. Here's an example of a bubble net movie. Then we have to take pictures of their tail flukes because that's how you identify individual humpback whales. There we go. That's the ID. So just looking at them from there, you go, well, they're pretty alien, aren't they? They grew up on the same planet or on the same star, and they have a global communication system, and their, socially network, their social network is complex, and they use tools, and in every other way, they're very intelligent. We can't put it down to their non-intelligence that we haven't communicated with them. I would put it down to our kind of anthropocentric viewpoint of our own communication system, but we're working on it. So here's an example of an intelligence filter. The outline, Russian letters, English letters, Arabic letters, Russian phonemes, dolphin whistles, humpback whale social and feeding calls all land within what we call the intelligence filter. If we got an extraterrestrial signal and it landed in this box, that would be news. That would be really interesting. Uh, unfortunately, squirrel monkey calls, ground squirrel calls, and so on, as well as... Uh, humpback whale and bird song fall outside the intelligence filter, but elephant rumbles fall in it. So we're working with different increasing species to see who lands in the intelligence filter. So the results are we can distinguish astrophysics from an intelligent extraterrestrial signal. We, uh, we know that other socially complex species obey the rules of information theory even an extraterrestrial system would have to obey the rules of information theory in order for knowledge transfer to take place. And that's an important point. You, they cannot get around what information theory measures. They would have to, their communication system would have to obey information theory. So we're beginning to apply this to uh, any kind of message signaling uh, that is obtained from the Allen Telescope Array. Eventually, the terrestrial application would be to be able to quantify uh, different species' ability to make syntax out of their communication system. And we think they'd maximize this because of the error recovery benefits. If we get an extraterrestrial signal, some anthropologists have said that uh, human complexity, human cultural complexity, led to human vocal complexity. So that if we measure the communication complexity of an extraterrestrial signal, we might also be able to obtain, at the same time, be obtaining their social complexity. So it's kind of a neat idea to measure the social complexity mathematically of an extraterrestrial civilization. So should we look up at the sky and say, are we alone? No, I think we should... Well, that's all very romantic and stuff, but we should be paying attention to the non-human communication systems on, Mar on Earth. We have millions to, uh, to learn from. Thank you very much. Are we alone? No. Here's goodbye, by the way. We think it means goodbye in humpback. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, that was a fantastic tour. I think um, you know, certainly one of the larger shocks here is the breadth of communication coming across everything from plants to um, the number of animal species, as well as the 
the complexity of those. Um, we'll also be getting joined uh, by Stuart Brand and Kevin Kelly, um, who are sorting some of the questions coming in from the audience, uh, or at least Kevin is, uh, and they'll uh, they'll be joining us uh, as well briefly. Um, but I'll start this off. Um, I, I'm curious as to you know, I think. S Many of us know that SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, as an agency has been doing this kind of work for a long time, but I'm curious, are, who else is doing SETI research around the world and uh, what other governments or other privately uh, funded organizations, um, and are any of them doing animal communications research like yours? Well, um, there are uh, SETI people in France and in uh, Russia and Australia and other places around the world, uh, but they're probably almost entirely radio astronomy people. And there is also an animal communications community that's doing research. Uh, since we introduced this idea of using information theory, it's been adopted by people studying gorillas and rattlesnakes and bats and, and uh, you know, all sorts of critters that signal each other. But as far as I know, um, uh, the colleagues I mentioned and I are the only ones that are mixing and matching SETI with animal communications. And what was We're your a background? Team. Cool. Uh, and what was your background that got you combining astrophysics and uh, and this research? Well, I was always interested in my astronomy career in uh, extraterrestrial life, and. Uh, my dad gave me a map of the solar system when I was six, and there's stars in the background. And he said, the stars are other people's suns. What? <laughs> I remember the shock of that, and it never quite left me. It's amazing. I was always interested in life in the universe. So I naturally migrated to SETI, but um, it seemed to me that when the astrobiology program started and everybody's using Mars as a proxy for, uh, sorry, Antarctica as a proxy for Mars, that uh, we could use non-human communication as a proxy for an extraterrestrial signal. So um, I got in touch with uh, some of the animal communications people working specifically with dolphins, Diana Reese, uh, Lori Marino, and eventually Brendan McCowan, who's now my colleague, and um, went up to see the, the dolphins at Marine World. And there's this vague notion that there's something helpful uh, from dolphins that could be applied to SETI. And that, but it had been uh, in the original SETI meeting that Frank Drake organized, there was a dolphin person. But nobody connected it. And then one day I had this idea of plotting um, to see if dolphins obeyed Ziff's law. And Brenda had sent me a paper and I took, uh, I think it was column three from table four or something like that, and I plotted it, and it gave a minus one slope. And so I went and had a cup of tea and did it again, and it was still minus one when I got back. So I called her, and ever since then, that was, we took off. There's one of those moments where you take off in a new direction. That was the first combination, I think, of uh, animal communications and SETI. Cool. Um, we have a couple questions coming in from the internet, and then we'll be pulling in uh, Stuart uh, soon after that. But we had several people, as well as Kevin Kelly. We had Corrado Mancuso from Facebook uh, stream, as well as Kevin Kelly, um, asking about different species and if they follow Ziff's law. And I think you might have shown this as a graph towards the end. Um, but do you know just to confirm the do the bees follow Ziff's law? The cotton and wasp communication and the humpbacks are they all on Ziff's law, or where do they fit? Humpback whales, yes. Bees, I haven't done yet, really. But I have an approach based on polar coordinates. Uh, and the bees seem to be able to find honey farther than the resolution of the waggle dance. So they may be using syntax. That would be an amazing thing to find out that bees have a second-order entropy. The cotton plant does not. The cotton plant definitely does not have second-order entropy. So bless their hearts. You know, it's very simple, straightforward, not much opportunity for error recovery. And that may be why the cotton plant puts 2.4 bits when if there are only two predators, it would only need uh, one bit to distinguish between them. But it puts in 2.4 bits of information when it transmits to that wasp. 
And so that may be making up for it in redundancy instead of uh, syntax. Interesting. Um, and we'll pull Stuart in for his question after this one. But um, Wilson Tang from the Facebook feed uh, asks, uh, has anyone ever applied Ziff's Law or some of these tools to analyze social media to understand fake news from real no news? And I, I think the other side of this question is, how about uh, machine-generated uh, communications uh, that, that we're now seeing, like machine-generated uh, stories? Fantastic idea. Uh, Ziff's Law... Um, I've been asked to apply it to undeciphered manus manuscripts. I'm working on a paper with Brenda right now, applying it to Rongo Rongo, which is the only undeciphered, well, it's the only written language of Polynesia. Uh, the Voynich manuscript, but, and also to, I hate to mention this, but I'll go ahead and stick my neck out, but somebody asked me to apply it to speaking in tongues in a church to see if it really was a language. So, yeah, it'll apply to all of the above. And I love the idea of applying it to machine code. I haven't done that yet. And, uh, you know, any of these kind of applications, drop me a line. Um, if I can do it without too much trouble, I'm happy to, uh, you know, to take a look to see if it indicates a language or not. A lot of things are claimed to be language that may not turn out to be. Uh, and... You know, the fact that we have a diversity in the in the animal community where some are and some aren't, and the ones we follow, Ziff's Law, do show syntax. Syntax. So, yeah, great question. I, would, I haven't done those yet, but I'd be up for it. Cool. All right. Well, we'll bring in Stuart Brand, uh, president and founder of Long Now um, and host of this series uh, before me. So welcome, Stuart. Greetings, Lawrence. This is terrific. Uh, you're finding such wonderful stuff where you've looked so far. I'm curious what questions uh, you're asking yourself that will lead you in what directions next. Well, um, I, with regard to humpback whales, um, we're looking into. I'm looking into the difference in information between humpback whale social calls and humpback whale song and comparing it with the difference between human speech and human song. Because uh, humpback whales have claimed we say they're singing, but do they do the same thing we do to produce a song versus speech? So that's one paper I'm working on. Another one has to do with bottlenose dolphins, where um, I was giving some lectures in the Canary Islands and observing uh, there using their, uh, you know, they have a lot of large telescopes in the Canaries and good weather. And there's a little island next to Tenerife that's called Gomera. And on Gomera, they have a whistle language developed 2,000 years now by the shepherds. And it's deep valleys and all, and they whistle to each other. So I went there and recorded a bunch of Gomera Silbo whistles, and we used them to classify the those whistles, we use the same technique that we use to classify dolphin whistles. So people that say you're comparing oranges and apples, well, now we're comparing oranges and oranges because we're comparing a human whistle language with a dolphin whistle language. So that's kind of an example of some of the things that we're doing to try and get a broader application in the animal communications community, but also in the SETI community. This is uh, information theory is handy stuff. So those are some things we're working on. We're also using um, information theory to um, further quantify some of the communication systems that may be happening with humpback whales. For example, when they jump out of the water and breach, uh, it's been recently suggested that that's a communication system. So we're looking, we're applying information theory to breaches and to see if it's a drumming kind of communication. So yeah, it's if I see you're smiling and I have to smile inside myself because the applications don't seem to be very limited. And if and when we ever get a extraterrestrial signal, we're gonna know something. Do the whales use different kinds of signaling when they're doing the long distance calls versus the whales they're right next to? Yes, uh, that's interesting. They. They uh, tone it down uh, when they're closer to each other. It turns out that whales, including humpback whales, can make uh, something like 180 dB 
uh, vocalization, which is like jet engine. So yeah, they uh, they know we're there and don't kill us with uh, you know shouting. And they the per- the percussive signals that they would do from breaching would be at a really low frequency that would travel further, like more like an elephant rumbling with its its uh, by stomping its foot, right? Well, very similar, except that it's a broadband signal. And what's interesting about it being broadband is that uh, the ocean's really good. There's certain aspects of the ocean, salinity and so on, but turns out magnesium sulfate in particular and boric acid are great absorbers of sound. And so uh, given that, that you can know the conditions of the ocean, the higher frequencies will be absorbed selectively with distance so that the distant humpback whale receiving the breach from one of the others would know by the absorption of the higher frequencies how far exactly that humpback whale is. So, yeah, they're, they're able to signal each other and get exact distance information to each other just from that first breach. The, uh, does, uh, do these breaches, uh, is there any way slaps or breaches would show a tempo that would be indicative of a Ziff law type relationship. Stay tuned. That's a famous SETI saying. We we always say stay tuned, and that's one we have to say this time. Uh, just one more question. Uh, you said you yeah. have been studying human speech versus human song, and are you getting uh, structurally different readings from that? Well, um, it's a little early still to tell, but we know that human octave music, I haven't done Eastern music yet or sitar or anything like that, but human octave music does obey Ziff's law quite well and has the same entropic structure uh, out to maybe third order entropy. The words, however, this is the song. These are the notes. The words, especially of some of the modern songs, uh, I'm afraid do not have very high order entropy, you know. I mean, I, I'm a great fan of Casey and the Sunshine Band, but that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh, I like it, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's not exactly Ziff's Law stuff. <laughs> nice. All right, well, thanks for joining us, Stuart. Uh, we'll we'll move you. on. Nice to meet you. My pleasure. We'll move on. We actually um, have some questions coming in from Laura Welcher, who's a linguist on our team, has worked on the Rosetta Project and uh, some of the uh, our efforts to um, write things that go, have gone into space, like on the original Rosetta mission. Um, she has a lot. Of, she has several questions, really, about meaning versus com- the knowledge that it is communication. Um, are, are are there parts of these tools that could be used to identify? Um, the meaning of this of these signals as well as just that they're intelligent? Yes, that's the big question right now is the, the transition into meaning. And I think the safe way to approach meaning is if you can start to analyze, uh, do information theoretic analysis of communication systems where you know what the purpose of the communication is, then you can begin to back out and quantify meaning. Uh, One example that E.O. Wilson pointed out was that an ant comes from a food source, talks to another ant, talks to another ant chemically, and and they also make little sounds. Uh, And then the other ant makes it to the food source within a certain Gaussian distribution. Well, you can actually quantify the, from that result, because you knew what the purpose of the communication was, you can quantify in bits how much minimum information the first ant had to have communicated to the second ant in order for the second ant to do that well at, at the purpose of the communication, which is finding the, the food source. And within the case of humpback whales, we know that the purpose of the bubble net is to catch fish and so on. So I think if we want to get at meaning, one of the ways we can approach it first is to start to analyze communications that we know the purpose of the communication. And we start to quantify how many minimum bits had to have been transmitted for the animal that was communicated with to have achieve be able to achieve amount of success at the purpose from that communication. So I think that's the safe way. And we might 
we might have some assumptions of uh, what someone's or what another species is trying to communicate. If they are sending a high-powered signal through space, we might think that some of those signals might say things like "hello," right? Um, yeah, so we, we and, have some of that. And the difficulty is that uh, there's mostly very complicated communication systems have a lot of symbolism in them. Like bees, for example, don't they talk about flowers? And there are no flowers in the hive. So they're talking about something isn't present. So you try and do a direct correlation with the actions. Oh, every time they say dolphin, they, uh, you know, they wave their hands or something. Or, and it's like what I'm doing is talking about something that isn't present. And so I'm using symbolic communication. And I know that's a catchword in linguistics you have to be careful with. But the bottom line is that a one-to-one -one correlation between actions and vocalizations does not take place if you're talking about something that isn't there. So that's another difficulty with trying to jump straight to, well, you can do simple things like there's a thunk call that dolphins make and the mothers make, and that means to the baby, come here right now. And there's a whoop call that uh, humpback whales make, and you make it back and they'll approach you. So it may mean welcome or hello or something. So, but it's only the simplest communications you're going to get that way. If they're communicating something more complex, it's probably symbolic. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we have, um, we're going to be wrapping up questions fairly soon here, but um, I wanted to invite on Kevin Kelly, uh, one of our other founding board members and the person who usually sorts these questions. So welcome, Kevin. Hi, Lawrence. How are you? Good. How's it going? Sorry I talked too long. <laughs> I really enjoyed your presentation, and it sparked all kinds of ideas. You were mentioning the idea of uh, using whale breaching as perhaps trying to interpret it as a form of communication. Uh -huh. I would suggest that studying human dance might be a good first step to try and understand wow. the structure of physical wow. communication. Um, and so wow, that's a neat idea. Human dance is a communication, and should you should be able to kind of get some kind of uh, grammar or vocabulary from that. The 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 one the other question wow. I had was um Neat. was about um one of the things that's pretty clear is that um uh, intelligence is not just binary, but it, it's also probably more than a single dimension. And right now you have basically just one dimension. You have the H, whatever that is. Um, have you done much work in trying to understand what the different dimensions of animal intelligence are? Because it's probably a pretty high dimensional space. Do you mean uh, variables in action, uh, variables in, in communication types? Like, for example, ants communicate chemically and audioly, and they even use drumming. On, uh, well, that's on a start. Some leaves that's a start, but it's very clear from the, the initial work in artificial intelligence that there are many varieties and different kinds of elements th that make up what we think of as intelligence. That is just not a single dimension. And your work so far with different like Ziff's laws and and the entropy suggests that there are probably multiple dimensions. And I'm wondering like, if you could kind of like instead of just saying well there's a ladder of intelligence in animals mm -hmm. and they climb up. Maybe it's three-dimensional or four-dimensional, and you know whales have a particular. Maybe they have a higher memory, or or um, another kind might have an ability to process deductively. Perhaps certain intelligences are um, better at um, solving some kind of efficiency. And so um, I'm just wondering in in this world of studying animal intelligence, whether there's any sense of mapping a taxonomy that's more than just a single dimension? Well, uh, like we have looked at other non-audio, uh, but audio is, of course, the one we can quantify the best. And, uh, you know, the basic idea of looking at audio signals first. This is a new field. Uh, it's... Uh, the idea of different, I think there's supposed to be 12 different kinds of intelligences. Uh, th we will not get encephalization quotient from aliens, you know. The one that applies to SETI is the communication intelligence. And using information complexity as a proxy for, for information intelligence. So if we get an extraterrestrial signal, I think that's the first kind of intelligence we'll get unless they land or whatever they do. And, I, and so it's a bit of a, 
Uh, we recognize there are different kinds of intelligence and different ways of expressing it, and we hope not to be prejudiced, hopefully but guided by the mathematics. But uh, we're just starting. This is a, I got some Templeton money, uh, and so, you know, this is really a, a budding field. It's just starting off. I know one thing was you have an assumption that you're looking for patterns of language, and I was wondering if you could imagine ETs that had intelligence without language or whether that's sort of something we just have to assume right now because we have that. Well, that's, uh, yeah, symbolic language. Uh, like it was, I guess it was the Babylonians had cuneiform and the ancient Egyptians had hieroglyphics and the Phoenicians got tired of translating between the two. So they said, let's just use the sounds. And so we have a field named after them phonetics. And that's kind of like, did that, they were the first to invent an alphabet, and the only one independently to invent an alphabet, except maybe the Maya. But, so yeah, we have, uh, when you mix and match huge fields, like linguistics and information theory with non-human communication systems, it's, yeah, so I can just beg that uh, we're starting out and playing it safe. But uh, we're aware. I have one last question. I'll let me turn it back to the um, to the audience. But um, I, I kind of envisioned for a long while the um, search for internet intelligence. And um, interesting. I, yeah. Do you have any suggestions about how you would structure that so that um, you kind of felt like you were on the boat, like you're going to filter out the com the common human to human communication and you're looking for another level of intelligence that's arising at a planetary scale. Um, do you have any suggestions or hints about how you would do the search for internet intelligence? Well, you're right. The, uh, if you could get rid of the linguistic, uh, you could look at just searches, I guess, and treat those as signaling units. Uh, that's a question I've never thought of. I'll have to think about it and happy to be in correspondence with you. But uh, yeah, the machine intelligence in general, but internet intelligence would be interesting to see if it obeys this law. I thought we could raise some money by uh, watching politicians give speeches and then we could have a little Ziff law indicator and see if it was babbling after they finished. <laughs> All the news media would pick it up. All right. Well, thank Thanks you a lot. Let's be in touch yeah. about that. I'll okay. think about it. Sorry, I had myself there muted. Uh, the um, we'll wrap up with these last couple of questions here. But uh, Adil Khan from the YouTube feed asks: Is SETI still crunching legacy data f uh, now that machine learning is more developed? So some of these old efforts, like uh, SETI at home, or some of the past um, listening feeds, uh, has are is some of the newer techniques being applied to that legacy data? You know, that's an interesting question. I have to ask Dan Witt, uh, Wertheimer about that. Uh, I don't know if they started to apply more AI or neural net techniques. Uh, they're still running SETI at home, but um, we started out by supplying the data at SETI Institute, and then Berkeley basically took over and cooked away. And uh, so that's a question I can't answer, but I will ask him. And I think one of the amazing things about your research that I found is that it's it's fundamentally it's separating the question or not it, is this communication from is this even intelligent communication to a certain extent there's obviously there's intelligence factor here that gets it further closer to Zipp's law um, but it also separates it from the question of what transmission techniques a civilization might use um, how sure. how are we li how are we listening for things that might give us some of this information. Well, um, you know, as I mentioned, narrowband carrier wave is what, you know, one hertz wide is where SETI does their search. And if they get a carrier wave, they don't look at the uh, content of the message. They just look at the carrier of the message. So if that's narrowband, then they can say there's a technology out there. Uh, assuming astrophysics can't make a one hertz wide band uh, carrier wave. So um, you can look at the radio information and if interstellar electrons are broadening the carrier wave as it goes across the galaxy, we would miss those civilizations. So looking at the content, I think, is an important addition to the radio search. 
The other, another way of doing SETI is optical SETI, where it turns out that we can get millisecond pulsars, but as far as we know, nature doesn't make nanosecond pulsars. They would fly apart. So even if you make them as strange quarks, but that's another story. But um, it's called optical SETI, and it looks for nanosecond pulses as indications of technology. But once again, we could look at the content of those pulses and the rate of those pulses because they'd be carrying information. And there's all sorts of other things we can do. Like um, I'll give another example is Mars has a natural microwave laser in its atmosphere pumped by the sun. And so at 10 microns, Mars, if you surround Mars with mirrors, you could send interstellar optical or infrared SETI over interstellar distances and be free because the Mar atmosphere of Mars is, you know, powered by the sun. And it does this amazing all the time. So there's an example of a SETI thing we may do someday. And uh, finally, I'm writing a paper now on what I call uh, quantum SETI. And it's basically uh, pointing out that, uh, well, for example, a quantum computer has not really been built. There are tests of it. And I would say Google has come the closest to demonstrating a quantum computer so far with NASA. But um, what if they're teleporting information? Then a very advanced civilization would use a quantum computer to teleport information. And so what if we received the first SETI signal in a quantum computer instead of a radio telescope? So I'm, I'm not advocating we give up radio searches. I'm just saying there, there's a diversity of SETI approaches that are all being thought of. And I'm working on a paper in particular about using quantum effects to tell if there are observers in other galaxies. Uh, so stay tuned. It's all very uh, budding. This is we're the, we're the new kid on the block. The average solar type star uh, around our neighborhood is much older than us. So we've been having radio for a couple hundred years. And, you know, so I expect anything we run into intelligence wise is going to be very much more advanced. And I would suspect that uh, what we're doing now will be naive, but you have to start somewhere. Indeed. Well, I want to thank you very much for this. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to ask is, uh, how is how is SETI faring during this time? Are you all able to continue your research? Is there parts that are being limited or not? Well, the early part, uh, the middle part of Drake Equation is suffering the most because that involves uh, searches for biology and uh, like the Yuri Miller experiment and things like that where you're trying to generate... Uh, early Earth-like conditions to see if biology uh, can occur, and also meteoritic man analysis, things like that. So uh, basically, getting in wet labs has not been possible. So, And the astronomers getting to the observatory is difficult, so they're having a hard time too. And we had to cancel our Alaska whale season this year, but that just means write papers. We got lots of data. So all down, up and down the Drake equation, uh, everybody's on hold, but they're getting their papers written and catching up. And now's a good time to ask them hard questions. Nice. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for this. And we hope to see all of you at the next talk. Thank you so much.